Good afternoon. I'm Kim McClary, president of Town Hall Los Angeles, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all here today to Town Hall Los Angeles. This will be a terrific program. We're so happy you're here. For those of you who are new to Town Hall, we're LA's oldest and largest public speakers forum, and our commitment to you is to provide you with compelling programs on the most timely issues, just like today's. Our marketing uh, director Kyle always says, remind everybody they can get social with Town Hall. Our hashtag is uh, hashtag heard at Town Hall LA. And if you get social with us, we have a drawing at every program and you get to win a free membership to Town Hall. And then you can go to the Hertzberg Forensic Lab. This is great. It all works together. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker and moderator today. Nicholas Bergruen is the founder and chairman of the Bergruen Institute, which is a nonpartisan think tank. As its chairman, he has fostered the study and the design of good governance for the 21st century. And he also rewards ideas that shape the future for the better through the annual Bergruen Prize of $1 million for the uh, it's the for philosophy, philosophy and culture, which I'm hoping he'll talk more about today. And D.A. Wallach, who will be our moderator with Mr. Bergruen, an American musician and business executive. As a musician, he is from a former lead singer of the group Chester French and is now with Har Harvest Records as a solo artist. He's also a renowned businessman. He was an early investor in Spotify and has advised several companies such as SpaceX, Emulate, and Ripple. Would you all please welcome our speaker and moderator. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. Nicholas, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us today. And we learned a little bit about you just there in the introduction, but as just a starting point, who are you, where do you come from, and how did you end up in L.A.? Okay. Well, first of all, um, thank you, D.A., for uh, volunteering to torture me for the next, um, I don't know, half an hour. And thank you for being tortured by us together uh, for the next um, few minutes. Uh, thank you for... Uh, Town Hall, LA, to uh, host us. Um, well, why am I here? It's a good question. Um, why is anybody in LA? Uh, I was, actually, I have a question. That'd be interesting. Um, can those who were born in the LA area raise their hands? You're, that's unusual. <laughs> <laughs> I would say 40%. In this room? Yes. Very high percentage. So you really are LA. This is, this is totally unique. Well, I was born in Paris. I grew up in Europe, then moved to New York, and I'm here now. And I think that, you know, if you're a curious person growing up any place, you want to go look at other cultures, other places. And that took me, and I was lucky, to be able to t travel all around the world. But in terms of you know, personal mission, in terms of what one wants to do in life, um, it's obvious in my case I've moved west. Um, Europe is a play great place to grow up, very grounding, culture, ideas, community. I, was, I always dreamt of America. I remember at 11, I went to three places, LA, San Francisco, New York, and um, spent one night in New York. It was a rainy uh, winter night, terrible night in terms of weather, but so inspiring. I saw all these vertical, um, you know, everything was vertical, vertical city. And I said to myself, I have to come here, there's so much energy. So I did move to New York. And New York at that time was a place in transformation. Every neighborhood was being reinvented. And it's, be, it's done. New York really has been reinvented. And New York is extraordinary. But it feels that the space 
for reinvention for the new um, is getting tighter and tighter in New York. And LA feels to me like New York was maybe 20, 30 years ago, meaning there's a lot of change and a lot of new ideas and new blood coming to LA. And LA, to me, feels like a place that's looking towards the future. And there's another enormous advantage that I think LA has, which is that you're Pacific facing. And for good or for bad, I think this is the Pacific century. So um, LA is a place that's open, a place that um, is you know, appreciative of new ideas and new people. And I think if one has a choice, one wants to be in that kind of environment. So I'm lucky to be here. And frankly, uh, my job, which is to um, uh, you know, help shepherd an institute which was created a few years ago, um, that institute came out of time I spent here in Los Angeles with some thinkers at UCLA and USC. Um, and slowly, as opposed to just thinking, I felt, well, let's put some of what I was learning into action. And Bob Hertzberg, who is here today, was from the very beginning some, someone that I've been able to work with together. We created something um, that is an effort focused on California, um, bipartisan, structural reforms for California, and Bob was my first partner in this. Then Antonia Hernandez, who's here too, uh, joined something um, called the Think Long Committee for California, and the Institute came out of these early efforts to work on reforms specifically for California. And I'm lucky that a number of my colleagues at the Institute, including uh, Bing Song from China, we have a we, we on purpose, talking about Pacific century, we on purpose are looking at the two sides of the world, politically and culturally. Um, but I'm lucky that I have some of my colleagues from the Institute here. So long way to answer your very precise question. <laughs> Apologies. I want to zoom in a little more on this kind of philosophical awakening that it sounds like you had several years ago, spending time on the West Coast, learning from academics, professional philosophers, politicians, as you were sort of trying to develop your own personal view about what the 21st century was going to look like and what were going to be the uh, key ideas and debates that were animating it. And how did you, as you went through that process, solidify some ideas about what the Institute could do, where the Institute could make a difference? Obviously, these questions of global governance, of the relationship between uh, the West and the East, so to speak, the role of culture uh, in, in this conversation um, are, are things that people are going to be thinking about in any case. But where do you think the Institute can play a role in shaping those conversations? So, I mean, there are quite a few organizations and very good ones that are so-called think tanks that work on policy on big questions of the day. And in that sense, we're no different than others. What makes us somewhat unique is that we are, number one, quite young. Um, two, uh, we're entirely independent. We don't rely on government funding or funding really from um, anyone today that gives us the freedom to do a few things that others may not uh, do as much as we do, which is we can take a very long-term view, we can focus on very fundamental issues, and go through them, and um, we can do it across cultures, which I already mentioned, so as opposed to just looking at things from a Western standpoint, from the beginning we looked at um, other ways of thinking about the world, uh, all the way from the east and everything in between. And we can do things across disciplines. So as opposed to uh, just being political or just uh, philosophical or just uh, technology focused, we really mix all of it because we feel they're all interconnected. So what are the big themes that we're interested in? We're interested in 
some that are political, and some that are much more about us as humans. So one of the key issues of our times, we think, in a positive way, but also in a way that's um, going to truly affect who we are, is that we, for the first time, can sort of create the new us. We can create uh, really a new species. Um, thanks to gene editing and artificial intelligence, we can affect the nature of what it is to be a human. And that's such a, such a deep uh, and far-reaching um, enterprise that uh, as exciting as it is, we have to also try to understand what are its effects on you know, us as humans and everything else that we affect. We know that we affect you know, uh, what's around us. Well, now we can not only affect what's around us, we can affect ourselves. So that's one of the big themes. Secondly, we, we're thinking about the future of democracy. You know, are democracies working as well as they have been, maybe, or as well as founding fathers in this country intended a democracy to work? Well, maybe not. And um, this is not just an American phenomenon. It's really happening in most democracies. Uh, there, there seems to be um, you know, a need to rethink uh, some of the principles. Can we come up with something that's, um, uh, you know, that can make democracies work better? It's a big theme and a difficult one. Next theme is rethinking capitalism. Capitalism is something that has conquered the world. Uh, so-called communist countries really operate as capitalist uh, environments. So capitalism has conquered the world. The question is, is it working well? Is it working for everyone? Can it be rethought? Can it work better? And then the last theme, um, talking about uh, different cultures, is really geopolitics. Uh, a world that was coming together over the last 30 years seems to be breaking up. And um, uh, how do you deal with it? Because this, this I don't think, is going to be a short-term phenomenon. It's something that's deep. Uh, but unless we can work together, at least uh, on a few different key subjects, uh, the, the, you know, we're going to have challenges if we don't know how to coexist uh, between uh, nations and cultures. So these are the big themes that um, uh, the Institute is focused on. As I understand it, you have pursued these questions in a number of different forums through your celebration of philosophers with the prize to the sorts of uh, colloquia and uh, salons that you guys host. You do events like this to reach out to the broader civic community. But I understand that it's very important to you that ultimately the Bagruen Institute has a physical home and that you've been working on what would really be a spectacular piece of architecture here in LA in a very prominent location. And I'm curious to understand why in this digital age, having a physical presence is so important to your vision of the Institute and how you view that physical location once you guys build it as playing a role, not only in the Institute's broader actions, but also in the civic life and intellectual conversation that happens within Los Angeles. I think that's a very good question, and, and you're right. In today's age, we could just say, well, uh, we, are, we exist um, virtually Why I have a physical presence. And frankly, the Institute started virtually. We've done a lot um, you know, by uh, putting our energies together as people. And uh, we could continue like that. But we're still physical beings, we're still analog, and we respond to each other as people, as communities. Why are we here today, physically? We could do all of this uh, on video. Uh, well, we still eat, we still like to be with each other. Um, why are cities growing? Cities are growing because people uh, need and want to be closer to each other, uh, even though the world is going uh, more and more digital. So. Going back to commitments and going back to Los Angeles, uh, we were lucky enough to be able to find the site, which is a very unique site. Uh, it's um, right above the Getty Center, uh, next to the 405. And um, that site um, 
is is entitled to uh, to to create more uh, a housing community. Uh, but we felt well maybe in an area where there are other uh, institutes uh, like Skirball uh, and obviously the Getty, uh, why not see if we could make it our home, our center for the institute? And um, we've uh, commissioned a very well-known architectural firm in Switzerland called Herzog and de Moran. They've done beautiful work in lots of cities around the world. They haven't done it yet in Los Angeles, but um, they've designed something that's very beautiful. And um, the idea is that it would be what I call sort of a modern day uh, secular monastery, meaning non-religious, but a place where people can gather uh, to work, think, um, and actually live, but on, on a scale that's monastic, meaning not big, uh, but very focused around the work we do, meaning ideas. So in that sense, um, it's a commitment to what we do, the world of ideas, and a commitment to Los Angeles. And um, we hope very much that uh, it will be part of the fabric of the city. Uh, today, we, the Institute actually uh, has its offices very nearby in an iconic Los Angeles building called the Bradbury Building, if you know it. Uh, and uh, I think we'll also remain downtown just because we like this, you know, Los Angeles is a distributed city, and to be uh, uh, to be east and to be west at the same time, we think, um, is actually of great value. As you think about Los Angeles taking a more prominent role in this global conversations around the five uh, areas of focus that you talked us through, uh, what do you imagine people in this room, who are obviously more civically engaged than the average, Angelinos could do to strengthen Los Angeles's position in that conversation? I mean, do you think it just sort of assumes this prominent role naturally, or do you think we as a community uh, are in need of different or new types of infrastructure to uh, give us the voice that we maybe ought to play? I think that's a very good question. Um, I mean, cities and successful cities don't happen by chance. They happen because of the energy and the commitment, uh, physical and mental, of the people who make that city. And Los Angeles is luckily a place that is not only thriving, but attracts more and more talent. I mean, people come from Europe, people come from Asia, from South America, but people come from America, from everywhere. And the fact that somebody like you, DA, who's young, who has choices, who's successful, can be any place but chooses to be here, I think says something. The amount of talent in lots of different areas that you know, has historically been in Los Angeles, but is more and more coming to Los Angeles, I think is great. Now, you don't create a community just by doing your, you know, whatever you do on your own. You do it by doing it with others. Obviously, town hall, here is an example of it. You come together because you're interested in um, certain subjects and in being together and doing something um, for Los Angeles. And I would say Los Angeles has the advantage on one side of being sort of ultimately free. I mean, you can look at it physically. It goes on forever uh, and it has you know, a personality that's different at every corner. I mean, it's a hundred different cities. And that's exciting and shows the diversity and the invention uh, that has come out of Los Angeles. At the same time, when you become so big and so complex, you have to come together on a few different things. And it's obvious that in Los Angeles, there are issues that need to be addressed and need to bring people together. And these are no secrets. They're around transportation, they're around housing, um, they're around energy, and these things are not new things, but these are the kind of things that can only be solved by community coming together. So um, Los Angeles has density in certain areas. Should it have more density around trans transportation nodes? Maybe. Transportation has to be uh, maybe more efficient, more available to most people at a lower cost. Um, same for housing. So you've got a number of different issues that uh, the issues of any city, 
but maybe more so uh, in a city like Los Angeles because one, it's, you know, it's so distributed and two, it is growing. And if Los Angeles is going to continue to be prosperous, it obviously it needs to address those issues. And um, I mean, you can address those issues as a community uh, because you have the capacity and you have the interest. So I think that that is one of the things that you know is challenge in Los Angeles is to come together uh, and actually make these things happen. Great. I want to ask you one last question, and then we're going to open it up to the room uh, for Q and A. And uh, we've spoken at a very high level about what you do, about the sort of areas you're interested in. But I want to get into the meat of what the Berggruen Institute has been supporting and talk about a couple of the philosophy prizes that you've given. And I, I want to understand, and I think folks here would be very interested in, what about the ideas of the philosophers you've honored in the past two years was so gripping to you and the rest of the committee that's in charge of uh, designating them with, with that great honor? Um, and, and how do you envision this interplay between these kinds of very practical on the ground things that we're talking about and these lofty, sometimes hypothetical sorts of philosophical exercises that these thinkers engage in? So DA uh, is alluding uh, to one of the things that the Institute uh, does, which is uh, try to give value to the world of ideas. So we give a yearly philosophy prize. And um, we did this, we started two years ago. So we have uh, two winners, uh, Honora O'Neill and Charles Taylor. And we're going to announce a winner quite soon, actually in the next two weeks. And this prize is being given away actually in New York. But we'll move the, uh, the award to LA once we are built. Uh, but so far, we do it at the New York Public Library uh, at the end of the year. And the idea behind the prize, and we call it the Philosophy and Culture Prize, is to reward the world of ideas. Why? Because we feel that ideas really shape who we are, shape culture. And um, if you think of the world we live in uh, physically, but at the end of the day, uh, mentally, They've been shaped by ideas, but by people who were thinkers 2,000 years ago. They may have been philosophers like Socrates. They may have been uh, political thinkers. Uh, they may have been religious thinkers, from Confucius uh, to, um, well, uh, Jesus. So you have an extraordinary array of people who, over thousands of years, have given us who we are today. And the idea of the Philosophy Prize is to continue to reward very long-term, very profound thinking around what it means to be a human being and how we should behave. Honora O'Neill was the winner last year, is a British uh, thinker. And her thinking, let's say most prominently, was centered around two things. Uh, ethics and technology, which, no surprise, I think is very important. Uh, technology, I talked about gene editing and artificial intelligence, is going to shape who we are more than anything else. Well, that if you can change yourself, if you can edit your children, if you can edit the human race, aren't there many ethical questions? That's one of the uh, key subjects. Another subject of hers was uh, around trust, and not just can you trust information, but can you trust the person, the trustworthiness of the origins of information. And that's a very good question. The, val you know, the value of the origins, the value of where um, information comes from, is the person um, where the origin trustworthy. Uh, Charles Taylor, the winner of the prize the year before, um, was interested really in community and in cultures, uh, saying, um, you know, cultures need to be able to uh, coexist, but it doesn't mean that they have to take each other over. So you can, you can be different 
and you've got to learn how to coexist um, as opposed to trying to necessarily mesh as one, uh, but at the same time not recognizing that there are others and respecting them uh, is difficult in a world that's really uh, global. So uh, we feel, again, long answer, apologies, but we feel that rewarding thinking and deep thinking uh, is a value in a world where I think we need not only uh, you know, commerce and technology, but we also need wisdom, because uh, the, what we've developed technologically is becoming only more powerful, and we need wisdom to accompany um, all these um, uh, possibilities. Great. Well, thank you, Nicholas. Let's open it up to the crowd for some questions. Um, and I don't know if we, oh, yeah. there's a microphone. Just have, uh, uh, welcome uh, for the Q&A the portion. And if you have a question for either DA or Mr. Bergruen, yeah, raise your <laughs> He's more interesting than me. So. Um, just raise your hand. And if you would just please introduce yourself. And Kyle will bring the microphone to you. Thank you. I'm sorry, this is for you, Mr. Begruen. <laughs> uh, my name is Tracy Williams, um, and I'm on the board of Town Hall. My question is, what were the great philosophers that had the most influence on you? And are you an avid reader of philosophy? What era? Um, what are your, obviously it's a passion. What is it, who is it that you read? So. And DA, you can answer that too. Okay. Yeah, that's a good one, you see. Um, so I, I'm, I read, but not enough. So reading more is better. Uh, but I used to read a lot. And when I grew up uh, as a teenager, I was very interested in, um, grew up, growing up in Paris, I was very interested in French existentialists. So Jean-Paul Sartre, if you know that name. Um, and then I was very interested in some German thinkers like Nietzsche. So, they shaped sort of the way I started thinking. But if you think of Sartre and you think of Nietzsche, it puts an enormous responsibility on you as an individual. And you have, in some ways, you, you have the lack of being someone and of being conscious that also makes you incredibly responsible for your acts. But that's very centered around the individual. And then, traveling around the world, I discovered a totally different way of thinking, which to me has had equal influence. Um, these are some thinkers and writers from the East, like Confucius, where the community is more important than the individual, exactly the opposite. And um, so I find the, the contrast in the juxtaposition of the two kinds of thinking um, totally fascinating. So I would, if, if somebody came to me and said, well, listen, what should, you, what should you read? I would advocate to read those very different and almost opposing uh, views of the world, because um, I think they can really inform each other, uh, the strengths of the individual, but also the strengths of the community. Uh, well, I'm awaiting Senator Hertzberg's new book, which I expect is going to be filled with interesting philosophical insights. Uh, historically, uh, Aristotle, in a strange way, always seems like he got it right. Uh, Wittgenstein, more recently, I believe was a very profound thinker. John Rawls. Uh, Michael Sandel today does interesting things, and uh, existentialist Andre Gors, I think very interesting, wrote a book called The Immaterial, that's about sort of the transition to a world of largely digital value. Uh, and in LA itself, uh, we've talked about before, Judea Pearl, I believe, is a national treasure. Uh, he's a computer scientist at UCLA whose work on the fundamental issues in artificial intelligence has had an impact already on the world that almost nobody appreciates, but may be uh, one of the most important contributions uh, in human thought in the past 50 or 100 years. Hello, Nicholas. 
Dia, you did a great job. Hi, I'm Judy Jernet. And the question I have is that your publicity preceded you. You know, we were all delighted when you came to Los Angeles and decided to make this your home. So thank you. And, but you have such a, a fascinating, interesting life between your businesses, your global experiences, the richness of it all, your institution. But most of us don't reside in that very philosophical, intellectual world. So it's fascinating to me. The question is, how do you manage your life? <laughs> Badly. Uh, so the, the good news about being curious and, and being engaged is that you do a lot, but the bad news is that you never get to do as much or everything you'd like. So at the end, you have to make choices. And um, hopefully, you make the, be the best choices. But that's the advantage I would think most people have in this room, that you can make your own choices. And um, so it's good to sometimes stand back and make those choices. And one of the things, talking about reading, one of the books that has had the most influence on me is a book by Hermann Hesse called Siddhartha, which is really, in my mind, the book, if you've read it, um, of allowing different chapters in your life to happen and to have really a different view of the world, a different interaction with the world, and basically forcing yourself to evolve uh, over time. And if I look at my life, I've changed it over time. And I would say that's the most interesting journey, is to allow change. It's maybe the hardest but it's the most interesting. DA, what about you? We, we, he should answer that question. <laughs> Same, badly. <laughs> That's not an answer. Hi, my name is um, Annie Zonneveld. I'm the president of Muslims for Progressive Values. And I'm glad you touched on, um, Nicholas, on uh, philosophers from Confucianism to Jesus. And I do a lot of work, human rights work, in the Muslim, in the Muslim world. And uh, we see this insurgent of tribal thinking. And I'm, I'm very interested in working in transforming people's mindsets. You know, we have this mindset here in the United States due to politics as well. But I don't think we can get to the point, as you say, where we can coexist culturally when until we come to the point where we can transform our mindsets to be uh, beyond tribalism and to be inclusive in our worldview. Is that something that you're interested in and if that's something you're thinking about? Well, to have a you know, peaceful world and a productive world, frankly, no choice, meaning we have to um, respect each other in terms of beliefs and cultures and learn how to coexist. That means everybody has to participate, so you can't have some participating and some not. That's, that's the difficulty. At the same time, I think that respect for different views of the world and different cultures also means that you know you, you accept to be different and you you don't try to necessarily evangelize or colonize the other side so you have to be you you, you can't so sort of decide to make everyone dressed like you um, and and therefore um, you have to respect the others but they also have to respect you and you can't um, sort of be asked to change or to convert to something, to someone else or to somebody else's beliefs. And I think um, uh, part of the issue here is that um, uh, people, a lot of people have felt, well, listen, my way of thinking is correct. Uh, therefore, others have to adopt it too. Well, no, uh, my, way of thinking, my way of thinking is fine for me. But if I'm going to respect others, they may be different. But they may not even want the idea of diversity. You have to respect that too. And that's a very difficult um, one to, to overcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Carl Dickerson. I'm uh, the vice chair here at Town Hall. And my question is this. Uh, I think the United States is the second largest democracy in the world, and we're having a problem 
uh, right now. Uh, our representatives are divisive and at loggerheads with each other. So my suggestion is this, and I'd like you to comment on it. Perhaps when an elected official, whether in Congress or the Senate, is elected, he or she, should she lose an election, is put on the government's payroll for 10 years. And the reason for that, it perhaps might foster more objectivity and be more interested in truly representing what the population wants and needs as a nation. Well, I think, I mean, I think you, you point to a really crucial question. Um, I'd love to get Senator Herzberg's um, reaction to this. But I think you point to a really important question. The representatives that are elected, who do they work for? Do they work for themselves? Do they work for their party? Or do they work for the country? And frankly, they're meant to work for the country. They want to work for all citizens. They meant, you know, government should be a service organization for everyone. Uh, it is the representatives are the delegation of people's voices. But once they're in power, that power shouldn't be an instrument um, of partisanship. It should be really at the service of citizens. And I think that's lost uh, in a lot of uh, democracies. And it seems to be lost in um, the way democracy is being practiced right now in the US. So if you're elected, uh, you really have earned the trust of the people. Uh, at the end of the day, you're supposed to serve everyone. You're not just supposed to serve the people who've elected you. And I think that, to me, is what's lost. Yay. Yeah, I guess I'd just add to that, that I think the, the premise of your question is a really provocative one, because our natural tendency is to, because we ourselves are, exist as individuals, to think that the behavior of other people uh, is the result purely of their own personality or their own deliberation, when in effect the behavior of many people in many situations is a function of the incentive structure around them. And what we've obviously produced, certainly in, in federal politics today, is an array of incentives that leads very talented, good people to behave in despicable ways, basically without exception. It, it has nothing to do with morally uh, convicting them or publicly shaming them. It has to do with how we might be able to mess with the knobs in the operating system to produce different behavior in the aggregate. And I think one of the things that's been basically taken off the table in American politics in the past 30 years is this sort of addressing of structural conditions. And that's why it's so great, the stuff that Nicholas was talking about working on with Senator Hertzberg. We as a democracy shouldn't be a static thing. We should be constantly trying to make the democracy itself work better. And so you can, in some ways, uh, try to accomplish that by resisting a particular type of conservatism. And I don't mean political party conservatism, but just the idea that some people in our country have that the Constitution sort of in word should be the absolute permanent governing structure. Uh, when other countries that we're competing with are much more dynamic and iterative. And in the world that I'm in of software development and company building, the companies that succeed are the ones that are constantly reflecting on themselves and trying to figure out if they can do things better. And those companies are the ones who over time get smarter, learn faster, and overcome their competition. And we've lost that ability. So I think these sorts of ideas really need to be much more fundamental to our political conversation. Bob, do you want to comment? We had candidates at the time of term limits that were against each other. And I was speaker. I had the power to appoint people. And I literally went to the losing candidate. One of my great frustrations in government is often people will come in and run, and then they're radio silent afterward. Are you committed to the community? Are you committed to public policy or not? 
And the people that cut and run, we always have people we joke about, they'd show up in an election, they'd run, and then you'd never see them again until the next election. And so we tried to do that. We literally, in a number of elections, appointed people to Coastal Commission jobs and other jobs, because in a term-limited dynamic, um, people are out so fast and you want to keep the talent in the system. So we didn't simply put them on the payroll, but we gave them commissions and dozens of people, we were able to do that and then help them develop as they became the next generation of leaders. And I thought it was to do on a bipartisan basis as well. Uh, hello, my name is James. Uh, hello, Edie and uh, Nick. My question is, uh, what's in your mind about the future uh, society? I like Nietzsche as well. Uh, if we follow the Nietzsche theories, we allow, let's say we build a society, we all allow all the humans to become self-actualization of financial freedoms, so all of them can allow to do whatever they want to do and become a superhuman in the end. Uh, that you, you, in the morning at the nine o'clock, you won't see any car driving by the, the downtown to work. But what kind of society you think you, it's really more practical? Because the fight is coming, actual reality is coming. You mentioned about the uh, identification and Charles Wolfe uh, from the internet. So what's, what's in your mind? Because when I think, really think we build a system that allow all humans become self actualization it really creates a huge problem for us, to, for the human, the future logic to to do. To, to Leaf. So, thank you. Well, Dia may have uh, his view, but if I understand the question correctly, if if everybody has a chance to do things for themselves, won't it create um, chaos? Um, and I agree. We have to be able to do something for ourselves, but we can't do it in isolation. So we have to do it with others. We are social creatures. We've been able to achieve what we've achieved today by working together. We wouldn't be in this room on the, I, don't know, I think, 51st floor. So, I mean, it, it wouldn't exist without cooperation. And it, in our future as a human race and as, a, as healthy, happy humans will only uh, happen through cooperation. So um, the, the beauty is that we can give more individual choice today than we could ever. Uh, a hundred years ago, uh, we didn't have the kind of choices we have today, and we'll have even more choices coming, but we can't do it in isolation. So we have to bridge um, the individual uh, opportunity and will uh, together with, um, with working with others. And that balance is, is, is tricky as individuals, as society, but also in politics. Thank you both for your comments. Uh, my name is Harrison Horowitz. I was working at a nearby think tank when you launched your institute and the big Think Long campaign. And we were all very excited to hear about the plan to save California. And as a native Californian, I was a little less um, optimistic, but hopeful for you and your work. And I'm wondering over the years what you found to be both the biggest problem that California is facing and the hurdle that's standing in the way of fixing it. Well, um, good question. I think that we tried to address some of the key issues in what we did when we created the Think Long Committee for California. Think Long Committee for California uh, was a bipartisan effort. I think we had 14 uh, Democrats and Republicans working together uh, from north and south, from different, um, uh, you know, uh, different kinds of activities, everything from politicians to uh, technologists to uh, union leaders. So we worked together and we came up with a blueprint, which actually is public. And um, uh, the, the key issues uh, for us um, are the issues that obviously are the ones that make our lives in general. But specific to California, California has a system of referendums. Um, which is quite unique and makes California maybe, you know, as a democratic environment, one of the most volatile environments um, in the U.S. or any place in the world. So the power of referendums 
uh, of propositions gives uh, people an enormous uh, stake in their future. At the same time, uh, we've seen it uh, when you have 40 million people uh, and when money is involved in these referendums, uh, they become really instruments. And um, uh, what we've worked on is to make the referendum system a uh, more open, uh, more uh, responsive to actually people, more uh, open to deliberation uh, than it was historically. And uh, with the help of uh, Senator Hertzberg and others on Think Long Committee, we were able to change the referendum system. So you can't take it away, never be able to take it away. It's part of the DNA of California. At the same time, to make it more uh, open, more responsive, uh, more uh, attuned to unintended consequences was something that we felt was key, and we were able to do it. It doesn't mean that referendums shouldn't continue to be reformed. As DA said, you have something, it may have worked or not worked, but you always have to reinvent it. The world changes, we change as humans, the rest of the world changes to, to, to keep up and to uh, have a better future. We have to be able to re reinvent ourselves. So even things that seem sacred need to be uh, rethought. For example, the referendum system. We are now uh, very focused on tax reform. Uh, the state is very dependent on uh, a few taxpayers. That means in good times, lots of money. Bad times, potentially the opposite. And then services get cut. So uh, a more uh, predictable, uh, safer stream of income uh, to provide services in the state. Therefore, a more stable tax income and a more in a modern tax system is something that we've been working on, again, bipartisan. Uh, and it's something that um, we hope to um, be able to make progress on uh, you know, in the next few years. But we will need your help. And again, we've got an enormous amount of uh, help and energy from, uh, sorry, you're being singled out, but with, for good reasons. Uh, from uh, Senator Hertzberg, who's worked very hard on uh, tax reform. But tax reform is key uh, for the state to remain competitive. Can I just add two more things that the Bureau Institute did, which doesn't get a lot of credit for it, but was critically important. One of the great challenges in government is people always get out there and want to do the I'm going to make you skinny and cure cancer act. And it never works. And it's to deal with the structures of governance. And so often, and I would argue, I'd suggest, I should say, that one of the reasons why Jerry Brown looked so good, some of the stuff he did, was some of the work, the, the legwork. Uh, Mr. McGowan won't take credit for this, but it's the truth, because he's a modest fellow, as you can see. But, for example, we have a rainy day fund. $13 billion, $850 million in a rainy day fund. That was part of our plan. That's what we worked for when Schnitzel was governor and got it done. Why is that so important? Because the volatility of the state of California is so critical, and we've never had that kind of thing. We only have a 1% reserve. Second, 50% plus one on the budget. That's not a Democrat or Republican thing. That is something that's critical because as you travel the world, as he did, and you see these horrible stories about these budget delays, well, often the budget delays are fights over 30 cents and a couple of political egos when, in fact, it adversely affects the California brand. And so now when you look at people having more confidence in government, why? Because the budget's done on time not three months late. So having a rainy day fund, having an ability to claw back initiatives like we did in the privacy and other initiatives recently dramatically affecting things. So the, the architecture, in my judgment, which so informs the practical question about the Institute is to focus on those governance issues, the foundation, not the super sexy stuff that grabs everybody's attention, like, you know, tax reform's troublesome and difficult, but it is very challenging in terms of how the state's currently organized. So he's willing to take on the toughest of issues without a lot of fanfare, and even now he's not even talking about it, but there were a number of things that we were able to do that I would suggest in the last number of years has been exceedingly critical as a result of the leadership in governance. Thank you. Uh, 
this is a much lighter question, at least in its structure, but I'll be interested to see how you take the personal and make it a more general idea. The one thing I knew about you from years ago, um, before I knew anything else, was that your nickname was the homeless billionaire because you traveled the world and you didn't have a permanent address. Well, now that you have a permanent address, I hope, in Los Angeles, I'm interested in what you looked for in a home for, that you were actually going to stay in and uh, de devolve, uh, in, involve out of. And DA, in a way, this is a question to you too, because you haven't been in LA very long. What have you looked for for yourself in living in Los Angeles, and what is that about? Tell, you, tell us about how you feel about LA. So I've been to DA's house. It's a great house. I, you, DA, I think you should invite everyone. <laughs> Let's do it. Right after lunch, we'll just, there'll be buses outside. So you stop. Uh, well, uh, I, I guess there's LA and then there's my actual house. Um, <laughs> LA, uh, it's just a great place. It's the most open-minded city in America. Uh, there are all kinds of people. And as an investor, I look for undervalued assets and LA's undervalued. It's undervalued in terms of the admittedly ridiculous cost of housing, but it's still undervalued relative to other places that are as cool. And uh, also people underestimate the diversity of the city. So the perception that this is an entertainment monoculture works to my advantage because I'm out here hunting for science-driven companies. And when I go over to Caltech or UCLA or USC and I'm looking for cool technology, there's not a line of investors around the block competing with me because they don't think it's in LA, but we know it is. Um, so LA's awesome. As for my own house, it's a weird house that's the product of harebrained additions and modifications by a series of crazy musicians of which I'm the most recent who have lived there. And uh, actually there was a theoretical premise to our purchase of this house, which was I had just read a great book that I recommend to everyone here by Stuart Brand called How Buildings Learn. And if you've never read this book, it's a classic of urban planning and architectural theory. But the premise of the book is that buildings over time get better at doing what they're supposed to do for the very simple reason that people live in them and the longer they live in them, they find out what's wrong with them and they fix it. And they give them new capabilities. And so this house that had no sort of plan from the beginning turned into a great house because as people lived in it over time, they figured out what was wrong with it and made it work better. And we get to benefit from that and hopefully uh, contribute to it ourselves. So even though I have a place, the reality is that there's so many good areas in LA, so many interesting and exciting areas that frankly, I should go back to the old model and not have a house because the, it, there's, there's a hundred different places that you want to be in in LA and they're all exciting and they all have one huge advantage. You have incredible light and uh, to me that's the most important. So if you have light and you can be in a, in, you know, part of a, a city that's exciting and transforming like LA, I mean, there's a hundred places. You like MacArthur. I love, Mac I, I love <laughs> MacArthur Park, which is nearby. I love, a f you know, I mean, and there's so many interesting areas. So, um, it, you know, for practical reasons, it's good to, you know, choose a place. But for me, for um, aspirational reasons, I'd, I'd love to be able to, to divide myself up into a hundred. And this will be the last question. Good afternoon, my name is Andy Garcia. I would like to thank both of you. Um, my question is, what are your thoughts in relation to the potential brain drain that might happen because of scarcity, not only in housing, but also the scarcity of what should be perhaps a new oil, which is water. And as an Angelino and other Angelinos, I saw how many of us are not from here. I'm from here, but... Um, and how this will affect moving forward, not only the complexities of Los Angeles, but of the world cities. I think a very good question. It goes back to you know, what's key 
to make a place like LA, a big city, work, you need infrastructure. And you pointed out to two, I mean, water uh, and housing. And um, uh, so again, it's a tricky balance. Uh, the city needs to provide for infrastructure, water, transportation. Housing has to be uh, accessible and affordable. But that also means the community has to allow it. And one of the issues in Los Angeles is that if you live somewhere and you know suddenly underneath you, across you, there's going to be a transportation. Um, it could be a subway, it could be a highway. You're going to say no. <laughs> so you, you know you you've got to balance. And this is one of the difficulties I think that LA has and has had historically, is to balance the need of the city, of the community, with the individual uh, wishes. And I think that needs to be uh, you know, balanced over time for the city to be, um, uh, continue to thrive and to, uh, and to keep um, you know, its talent, as you say. Uh, you know, people have to come together uh, to be able to address you know, those key issues. I agree. And I think, I mean, the one thing I'd add is that from my view as a technology investor, it's important to distinguish what problems have potential technological solutions uh, from those problems that are basically human organization problems. So something like uh, access to housing or, or plentiful housing, uh, it's, in some ways it's not a real problem because the solution is really simple. You build more housing. And the failure is a human collective action failure to actually agree on how to do that. But that's for politicians to, to litigate and culture to litigate. Uh, other things like clean water, I'm optimistic about technology's potential to solve. Um, we have these elements in enough abundance on the planet that with the right engineering approach, uh, I hope that 50 or 100 years from now, uh, access to clean water, as one example, is almost something that seems like it would have been ridiculous that people were worried about it. Um, we should be able to manufacture as much clean water as we need as a species. And um, that's, that's the sort of thing that governments can help support funding in because a lot of these big technology problems don't get funded ultimately without partnership between government and, and private enterprise. Agreed. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much for taking the time. And um, uh, I think we are, we are on your side, meaning we are on the side of LA. So we're here to, I'm here anyway to serve. So whatever we can do, uh, to make the city um, that is already, I think, a, a city of dreams, but to make the dreams, um, you know, come true in a, in a better way. Uh, the Institute is certainly there to do this, and, um, and I've made a commitment in that direction, and I know all of you have. So thank you, and thank you, DA. Thanks. Thank you to Nicholas Bergeron and D.A. Wallach for a very informed conversation, and we look forward to hearing more, many great things from the Institute. Thank you for coming to Town Hall. We hope to see you here again.